Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the hard scriptures. Those scriptures that cause us to get on our knees and ask for understanding and insight. Those scriptures where as insight comes, Lord, the challenge of the message becomes a burden. Those scriptures where the word to us is one that we'd probably run from were it left to us. But Father, I thank you for those hard scriptures where you call us to acknowledge the seriousness of our sin, our transgression, and to turn from that to repentance and trust in you. And so, Lord, I pray, just as we were singing in in the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, we sang about pardon for sin. And, Father, by your Holy Spirit's presence and movement among us this morning as he encourages our hearts, my prayer is that although I ask that we would be convicted of our sin, I pray that none of us would just remain motionless and, and standing in place, but that we would pursue the pardon of sin that is offered to us in Jesus Christ, that we would turn from conviction and seek the Christ. And Lord, knowing that he welcomes us with open arms again as we sang, full of grace and mercy for those who come humbly asking him for protection. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the good news that we've heard about him. And we pray, Lord, that our hearts would be encouraged to live lives of holiness, to honor you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For we ask this in the name of our Savior. Amen. I've got to confess to you that uh, if Daniel 7 made me a little nervous to preach, um, Daniel 8 is intimidating just because of the difficulties of interpretation. Uh, You'll be very happy to know I'll leave most of the uh, very, very tricky parts of this passage to be interpreted in next week's sermon, following the structure of the chapter itself. Uh, But I just want to say a couple things that... If, if you have a collection of commentaries representing various centuries of the Christian church and various um, positions within the Protestant movement, and, and you turn to Daniel chapter 8, the odds are probably all of them will say something different about da- some of the details in Daniel chapter 8. Some of the details, the first few verses, are actually, there's incredible um, unanimity. There's an incredible consensus around the first uh, eight verses or so. It's about verse nine where things get tricky. And the commentators are all over the map. And so I've had a great deal of difficulty uh, in my life with the last half of Daniel chapter eight. I've had a great dif- deal of difficulty in the many years I've studied this passage. And I've changed my position two or three times on uh, the last half of this chapter. And so what I want to encourage you is uh, I will go in the direction that I currently feel is the right one uh, when we get to some of the tricky parts, especially after verse 9. And you may differ. And you may may come to different conclusions, as many, many better commentators than myself have done. They've come to different conclusions than I will. And that's a good thing. But I do ask that you would at least consider what I have to say, but more importantly, look with me to see what is the Holy Spirit saying to us through this chapter. And let's be attentive to him. Let's be submissive to him. Let's understand and appreciate that tricky passages of scripture will lead to all kinds of different understandings. But the message of scripture is one and very clear. It's about God, our sin, the Savior, and the day of glory that's to come. And so let's hope in Jesus as we go through this passage. Amen? Amen. Okay. Well, at the end of Daniel chapter 7... Daniel described the effect that his first vision had on him, the vision in chapter 7, which was Daniel's first vision. And Daniel described that effect that it had on him in words that talk about shock and being full of dread and fear for his people. The Jews, those were Daniel's people. And Daniel was worried about the future as chapter 7 came to an end. Well, two years later, he has another vision, and that's the one we're looking at today. Two years later, he has this vision, and if you skip to the end of chapter 8, you see that this vision leaves him sick for days, overwhelmed and devastated. That's chapter 8. 
when I took uh, preaching in seminary, the, the various preaching classes I had to take, uh, you know, the one professor taught that we should look to see what the mood of the chapter is, mood of the passage, and try to convey that mood. That should also be the mood of the sermon. And so if, if chapter 8 leaves Daniel feeling sick and overwhelmed, then my sermon should leave us feeling sick and overwhelmed. And I thought, okay, well, that's not hard. That's going to come. And uh, But no, seriously, uh, that, that that would be that would be the impact that this scripture would have on us if it if it has the same impact on us that it has on Daniel and if he understood it rightly which we assume he did this was hard for Daniel to see this vision i mean it was hard for him to see daniel loved the home that he had been taken from in jerusalem when he was a boy he lived the rest of his life in Babylon, but he loved Jerusalem. He loved the jewel of ancient Israel, the home of the temple of Yahweh. It was destroyed by the armies of Babylon a few years after Daniel and his friends were taken captive, but he loved it nonetheless. And so did the people, the rest of the exiled Jews living among Babylonian countries, Babylonian provinces. See, the fate of the people, the Jews, was tied to the fate of the city of Jerusalem throughout the writings of the prophets. So to long for Jerusalem's restoration, for better days for Jerusalem, was to long for the restoration of the Jewish people. Jerusalem was the symbol of God's promises to Israel. It was a sign of it was a sign of God's salvation. A little bit, and I don't mean to overstate it, but a little bit like how Christians have a sort of affection for the symbol of the cross because of what it means to us. In a little bit of that way, Jerusalem had that kind of symbol, symbolism to the Jews, and it was a symbol of God's faithfulness, God's salvation, the hope in God, God's activity on the earth among them. The city itself of Jerusalem. And so in chapter 8, Daniel resumes writing in Hebrew. If you remember, at the very beginning of this book, in chapter 1, Daniel was writing in Hebrew. And then a couple of verses into chapter 2, he switched to Aramaic, a Gentile language, and wrote in Aramaic all the way through the book of Daniel until now. Now in chapter 8, verse 1, he comes back to the Hebrew language. And a great number of commentators are in agreement that, not all of them, but a great many are in agreement that this suggests Daniel's theme is back to the Jewish people. Daniel is now writing about things that directly concern uh, the fate of Jerusalem and his people, the Jews, because he's writing in their language again. And so, this is about Jerusalem and the Jews, Daniel's people, the prophecies so far, the four statue uh, empires in chapter 2, the four beast empires in chapter 7. These are mainly about the rest of the nations of the earth rebelling about the kingdom of God. And now with chapter 8, back into Hebrew, we come to the question, what about Israel? What is God doing with Israel? And I've heard some atheists argue and we had an interesting conversation last night at Life Explored that got into some of these kinds of things. But I've heard some atheists argue that God cannot be real since there's so much evil and suffering in the world. And philosophically, Christian philosophers have wrestled with that because it is a significant challenge philosophically. But there are good answers to it. But I would respond just a, a little bit from my, you know, simple way of looking at this at times, that I would respond, well, you say God can't be real since there's so much evil and suffering in the world. I say, because God is real, and because of the kind of God he is, the day will come when there's no more evil in the world. The reason we care about evil at all and human suffering at all, the reason we care is because we are made in the image of God. And so we ask questions about life and death, good and evil, and they matter. Those questions matter. They're significant. And the Bible is rich with hope and promise that suffering really matters to God. But so does evil. So does sin. And so does our sin. 
And in spite of all that, what do we humans do? Living in the world that God has made. We tend to ruin it. We ruin our lives. We ruin the world. We ruin the lives of people around us. We ruin our relationship with the Creator. And the Bible promises that God will one day restore what sin has ruined. And we have a reminder of that promise of restoration in this prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. So what I see here, by way of outline, is the long-range forecast calls for desolation. Look with me at beginning in the cha- beginning of the chapter in verse 1. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 1, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the capital, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. So, as I've said before, since Jeremiah, ever since Jeremiah had sent a messenger, this is in Jeremiah chapter 51, to, this messenger came to preach in the streets of Babylon a long time earlier, then ever since then, the city where Daniel lived most of his life had an understanding, and the Jewish exiles living in that city had an understanding from Jeremiah's ministry, that the day was coming when God had prophesied that the king of Persia would come and kick the king of Babylon's butt. That, that was prophesied, not in those terms, that's my translation, uh, but it's prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 51 and other places. And that was old news now. So the Jewish exiles living in, Jeru- in, living in Babylon, like Daniel, had that expectation that when the king of Persia come, it was all over for Babylon. A bigger, badder army was going to come and conquer the big, bad army that conquered Jerusalem. You see? And so they had that hope, that expectation. Vengeance was coming. And when Daniel had this vision, the year was 550 BC, and he saw himself standing in the vision. He was in Babylon, but he saw himself in the vision standing in Susa, the capital of one of Babylonia's provinces, Elam. And he sees another beast. And this other beast he sees is a ram with two tall horns. And in case you're wondering, what could this be? Well, verse 20 tells us later on in the chapter, and we'll talk about this more next week, but we won't spend too much time on, the, on what I touch on this morning. Next week, we won't try to overlap too much. But next week, we'll see again. Verse 20 says that ram is Persia. So the the angel giving the interpretation to Daniel leaves us with no question here. He tells us in verse 20, this ram with the two horns, it's Persia. And the two horns represent the kingdom of Media and the kingdom of Persia, which together were the Persian Empire. There we go. That was easy. What was I so afraid of? And so this helps us make sense of these verses. The two horns are tall, but with the taller one came up, rose up, after the, the, the shorter one, which represents the way that at first Persia, the, the kingdom was ruled by the kingdom of the Medes, Media. And later on, the kingdom of Persia became prominent, so it came up higher, and under Cyrus the Great became the dominant kingdom over all of the other territory that the Medes had ru- ruled. And so the kingdom of Persia came up second and higher. Well, what's interesting is that that year, the year Daniel saw this vision, 550 BC, was the year when King Cyrus conquered Media and took over. The Persians became the higher higher horn. The Persians became prominent. It was that year. He was seeing current events in the symbolic prophecy. But they didn't stay current events for very long because what he sees is as he looks in his vision, and in those verses we see it, that the ram is standing on the bank of the Ulai Canal where Daniel was, which tells us, if you look on an ancient map of Persia, or of Susa, the the capital of Elam, you look on that map and you see the Ulai Canal was east of the city, in the direction of Persia. Babylon was on the other side of the city. 
So what this uh, ram is doing, this ram is standing on the bank of the canal, looking at Susa and looking west. It's a boat. It's getting ready to charge. For Daniel, who worked for the government of Babylon in that year 550, a few details I think really stood out here concerning like things that as a government official, as the prime minister of Babylon, he would be very interested in. First, the ram was on the bank of the canal, which meant it was about to take the city of Susa on the other side of the river. Second, the province of Elam, on the border, it was the border between Babylonia and Persia, and it was the buffer zone, and it was about to fall to the Persians. Third, the ram was looking west toward Babylon and was getting ready to charge. Look with me again at verse 4. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was none who could rescue him from rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. See, this all happened ten years later. When Cyrus the Great conquered Susa, he made Susa his capital, and then he proceeded west and took Babylon and all the territories that belonged to Babylon. After Babylon, Cyrus did conquer north. He consolidated all that had been previously conquered in Lydia and everything from the northwest in the Lydia area, this is sort of modern day Turkey, all the way east in the north still, all the way towards the northeast in India, where he was stopped. He died conquering the north, up north of Afghanistan. Can you believe that? Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, that was where King Cyrus died trying to expand his empire there. But the prophecy says he expands west, then north, then south. And so after Cyrus's death, his son, Cambyses, something like that, Cambyses II, conquered Egypt, proceeding south, in the same way the prophecy described. West, north, south. Now this stands out to me as a remarkable thing, that this prophecy ten years earlier than any of this had happened tells us not only what was going to happen in the short term, but also in the long term, the shape of the expansion of the Persian Empire. There is on Wikipedia a little uh, gif, you know those little animated graphics? There's a, on Wikipedia, you can look it up and you can ask me for my notes and there's a link. There's a gift that tell, shows the, the shape of the expansion of the Persian Empire, which matches verse 4 in this prophecy. I thought that was pretty cool. One ancient Greek historian even describes Cyrus's plans to conquer in exactly that, those terms, west, north, south. But Cyrus is killed, his son takes the throne, and after him other Persian kings take the throne. And the empire grows a little bit in the same directions they had already grown. Uh, but during that time, nobody could stop them. The verse tells us they bowed to nobody, they did all that was according to their will. They established the largest empire the world had ever seen. So the Persian Empire, the backdrop to the Bible books like Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, was a really welcome change for the Jewish people. After Babylon had destroyed Jerusalem, the Persian Empire promised a deliverance, promised restoration back to the city, and in fact that happened. After the decrees of the Persian kings, many Jews returned home to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was rebuilt, eventually a temple was rebuilt, all under Persian rule. So the Persians were good for the Jews. But, if you're familiar with all that the Old Testament had said, the Old Testament didn't stop at being returned to Jerusalem after 70 years after Babylon. The Old Testament stopped, didn't stop there. There were further warnings. If you read in Exodus, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy 28, verse 66, there was still a warning from God of worse times ahead if the people still did not turn and repent from their sins. Deuteronomy 28 uh, promised that if you continue in that path, even after all the times of mercy God gives, then the Jewish people would be scattered among the nations of the earth. What I find even worse is in Deuteronomy 28, 66. It says, your life shall hang in doubt before you. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, if only it were evening. And at evening you shall say, if only it were morning. 
because of the dread that your heart shall feel. Imagine that. Waking up in the morning and wishing it were evening. And in the evening wishing it were already morning because of the anxiety, the fear, the hopelessness in your heart, the dread. This was what God prophesied in Deuteronomy 28 would be the state of the people after they're scattered among the nations, after the land has been left desolate. That was still to come from this perspective in Daniel chapter 8. Well, next we see after Persian rule comes Greek rule. So Daniel sees a male goat. The uh, various translations are interesting here. Some say a rough goat. Some say a shaggy goat. Uh, I think all those basically mean some kind of male goat. Um, I don't know what quite to make of that. But we'll move straight along. Look with me at verse 5. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. Let's stop there. The interpretation given in verse 21, again, names this goat as the kingdom of Greece. Now, I... I, I don't want to bore you with a ton of history. I've struggled with how do I preach this prophecy? How do I preach this passage which involves a ton of history? The details are historical. Uh, So I I trust you'll bear with me and kind of uh, wait for the point because I think there is a clear point. But this uh, verse 21 identifies this goat, the rough goat or the shaggy goat or the male goat as the kingdom of Grecia, the Greek empire we would call it today. And it identifies that prominent horn, the conspicuous horn between his eyes at first, as Alexander the Great, the first king. So this this king uh, ruling the Greek empire rushes at the Persian goat and seems to fly across the earth as his empire expands and he eats up everything that had belonged to the Persians. And the verse tells us he came directly against the Medo-Persian empire and conquered Susa itself, which happened in 313 BC, 331 BC. Look with me at verses 6 and 7 again. It says, he came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram. It's kind of an odd way to say it if you're charging the thing. Well, of course it's going to come close to it. But it says, I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. It is fascinating to read the historical details here and see that Alexander's route of conquests as he began expanding his empire pretty much followed the path that the king of Persia ran to escape. The king of Persia fled from Alexander in battle after battle. And this was kind of the the plot that Alexander's armies followed on the map, literally chasing Darius III, chasing the king of Persia as he fled from battle after battle. First in Syria, then in Babylonia, then in Media, and then in the Persian heartland itself in Parthia, where Darius eventually III was killed, ending the dynasty that had begun with Cyrus. And then Alexander's army stamped out what was left of Persian rule, going as far north into the northern provinces of Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Well, I hope you're not bored yet, because there's more to come. Alexander's greatness reached its limit in the year 326 in northern India at the river, and I have no idea how to pronounce it. I think it's Hiphasis, Hiphasis, the Bias River today in India. And uh, there he was stopped. He couldn't go further. His army was kind of saying, we're going home. And look with me at verse 8. Then the goat became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. So Alexander, he was stopped there. That was the limit of his expansion. And he returned to Susa, where this vision takes place in the first place, and where he consolidated his control over his empire, over his new empire, with a mass wedding between Persians and Greeks. And uh, after that, he returns to Babylon, where on June 10th or 11th, um, in the year 323 BC, Alexander suddenly dies in the prime of his youth. At the height of his strength, 
Some suggest he was assassinated. He died by poison. Some other scholars suggest it was some kind of fever. Even uh, the West Nile fever has been recently suggested. But he died in the year 323, suddenly at the height of his power. His empire was divided so that you see the conspicuous horn was broken off and replaced by four other horns that grew up in its place. So Alexander's empire was divided, and this this is kind of a famous note of history, into four other kingdoms that ate up or that divided up the former large Greek empire. And those kingdoms were finally properly divided or uh, settled into four parts around the year 301 BC after the Battle of Ipsus. So again, if you're wikipedia this stuff, looking it up, those are the key keywords to look for. And the kingdoms, the four kingdoms were first Ptolemy founded a kingdom in Egypt, Cassander founded a kingdom in Macedonia and Greece, Lysimachus founded a kingdom in Thrace, that's what we call uh, Western Turkey today, and Seleucus in the rest of the empire, eventually settling in Syria, which is kind of famous in the news these days. So Alexander's empire was divided up into these four horns, which eventually each fell to Rome. These four kingdoms each fell to Rome in time. Seleucus acquired Thrace in 281 BC. Rome conquered the Greek heartland in 168 BC. Pompey took Syria for Rome in 64 BC. I'm kind of just trying to get through this as quickly as possible. Caesar Augustus conquered Egypt in 30 BC. That was the fourth and final one under Queen Cleopatra. And so Daniel's vision with the four horns that replace the one prominent horn on the head of the Greek goat, Daniel's vision brings us up just about 25 years or so short of Luke chapter 2 verse 1 where we read in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered which forced Joseph to take Mary to register in Bethlehem and you know the rest of the story this is a time when the Jewish people were weary of being trampled down by Gentile occupiers by one foreign power after another, longing for the day when Jerusalem would be free again. So what about Jerusalem? The vision of the four beasts in chapter 7 tells about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire from that point forward until the end of time, until the, not of time, until the end of this age when Jesus will return and bring about a kingdom that fills the whole world forever. That chapter, chapter 7, told us about how a little horn from Rome would wage war against the saints, a mysterious holy people that are unidentified as far as their, their roots in that passage. And Daniel sees that the saints will one day inherit the kingdom of God and rule over all the earth. But what about the Jews? What about Daniel's people? What about Jerusalem? Had not God promised Solomon that David's kingdom would rise again in Jerusalem. In Matthew 23, Jesus says in a way, what about Jerusalem? When he, it says he weeps, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I ha- would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing See, your house is left to you desolate. The offshoot horn. And this next portion in Daniel's prophecy in chapter 8 is very hard to explain. I'm not 100%. And I'll leave most of the interpretation anyway, anyway until next week, but... What is clear is that this passage deals with Daniel's people, the Jews, and the city of Jerusalem. And the predictions about both the Jews and the city of Jerusalem can be boiled down into one word. That same word that Jesus used when he cried and wept over Jerusalem. Desolate. Desolation. Look with me at verse 9. Out of one of them, that is, out of one of those four horns that took up the rest of the Greek empire, out of one of them. Now, let me just point out, we'll talk about this next week, but let me point out how odd that is. It's the only time in any of these visions when there's a horn that grows out of another horn. 
You, you see how that's odd. You picture it. Okay. Usually horns don't grow out of other horns. Now, I figure maybe it looked a little bit like a deer's antler. I don't know. Whatever the case is, this is extremely odd. And it, the horn does not grow directly out of the Greek goat, but indirectly out of one of the horns of the Greek goat, which is going to be difficult to work out. Anyway, so verse 9 says, this little horn is, according to the interpretation of verse 23, it's a king or a kingdom. It says this, out of one of them grew a, a, a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land, which almost all scholars interpret as um, what we would call Israel, you know, the land of the Jews, Palestine. Um, by Palestine, I, I don't mean modern day Palestine, but the Roman province of Palestine. Let's just be clear on our, our terms here. So, this little horn is a kingdom, like all the other horns in Daniel's visions. And verse 9 said that this kingdom will grow exceedingly great from Daniel's point of view, pro probably from Susa's point of view. This horn would grow exceedingly great in different directions. First south, then east, and then towards the glorious land, which presumably lay neither south nor east from that point of view. Look at verse 10. It grew great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. Well, of the other 15 times in the Bible this phrase is used, the host of heaven. It appears 15 times, or 16 altogether. But of the other 15 times, at least 12 of them, I'm unsure on a couple, but at least 12 of them are about the pagan worship of the sun, the moon, and the constellations. For example, in 2 Kings 23.5, where it's about worshiping the stars, worshiping the planets, and so on. The first nine shows the geographical growth of this kingdom in the different directions of the compass, then I'm suggesting verse um, 10 shows something of the spiritual growth of this kingdom. It looks like this is growing spiritually powerful. Its victims, according to the verse, verse 10, its victims will include some of the host, that is, some of the people of the kingdom of God, it, 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 its victims will include the truth itself will be trampled to the ground. Now look at verse 11, because that was simple. So verse 11 says, It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. So, if verse 9 is geography and verse 10 is spiritual, then maybe verse 11 is blasphemy, blasphemous growth, anti-God growth, maybe even anti-Christian growth. It says that first it will rise against the commander or the ruler of the host or the army, that is, of God's kingdom. Now, I would, be, I would have a hard time understanding what, who is the commander of the host, who is the prince of the army that is being talked about here, except later on in verse 25 it tells us this is the prince of princes. In other words, the king of kings. And so it leaves very little doubt to most commentators that this is talking about Jesus. Some have argued this is one of the high priests during the time of the Maccabees, which other commentators say, how can, how can that ever in the Bible be referred to as the prince of princes? In verse 25, that's how it's interpreted. So the, king of the, the prince of the host or the commander of the army of God's kingdom is none other than Christ, the prince of princes. The second thing that happens here is it will take away the regular worship that belongs to the prince of princes. That word regular burnt offering is a single word in the Hebrew. It just is tamid, which uh, occurs all over the Old Testament. And some scholars say it always means the burnt offering. But if you do a word search in Strong's, you just find it's frequently used with everything that's part of the regular permanent pattern of worship for ancient Israel. So it includes the showbread, the altars, the laver, everything else is permanent and regular. So the regular here, the, the tamid, is the continual normal worship of God, the way people are instructed to worship God. So this is taking away. The regular worship that belongs to the prince of princes is taken away from him. 
The third thing that happens here in verse 11, this little horn will overthrow the place of the sanctuary. That's what the word means. The place of the sanctuary, the foundation of the sanctuary. Well, I'm finding this difficult so far. How are you? Daniel's vision implies that by this time, when this happens, because much of this activity is directly against the prince of princes himself, that the prince of princes will have already come, that Jesus will have already come, that God's kingdom will have already begun in some way, in the way Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. That some of the people of God's kingdom, some of the host, says in verse 11, some of the host will suffer at the hands of this offshoot kingdom. Offshoot from one of the other four horns, I mean. And that Jerusalem itself, that is the place of the sanctuary, not the temple, but rather the place or the foundation of the holy place, will be overthrown. That's a lot to accomplish. The heir to David's kingdom, that is Jesus, the son of David, he will have already come, but some of his people will be prevented from worshiping him. They will be trampled down and Jerusalem will be occupied all by this little horn. That's why I said we're going to talk about what that means next week. Next we see that desolations are called for because of sin. And if some of this passage is really hard to interpret, other parts of this passage are like, this is difficult to hear. Some translations read verses 12 and 13 a little bit differently, but for a whole bunch of reasons, which I outline in my, in my sermon notes, if you want a copy later, um, I agree with the ESV, the English Standard Version, and how this is worded. Verse 12 functions like a sort of a, an, uh, a summary, a brief summary of the whole career of this little horn and what he gets away with and why. If you and I loved Jerusalem like Daniel loved Jerusalem and if we cared for the Jewish people like Daniel cared for the Jewish people, we would want to know, Lord, why? How could God let this happen? And the answer in verse 12 is hard to hear. It's simply this, because of transgression. Look with me at verse 12. A host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering, or that is with the regular worship, because of transgression. And it will throw truth truth to the ground and will act and prosper. The King James uh, and New King James say something like uh, a little bit differently, but the NIV, New American Standard, and ESV are all in agreement here, which I agree with myself, that this is saying because of transgression. When you see this prophecy, in verse 12 in particular, in light of what was currently going on for the whole Jewish people in exile, homeless, it brings to mind the warning that God had given to King Solomon in Second Chronicles chapter 7. Verse 19 to 22 reads like this. Now listen. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you, and you go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from, the, from my land that I have given you, and this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods, and worshipped them, and served them, therefore he has brought all this disaster on them. That's what verse 12 means when it says all this happens because of transgression. This was an old warning to the Jewish people. God had sent prophet after prophet to warn Israel that this was going to happen. Ever since God first warned Israel through Moses in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. This was old. 
Verse 12 says that the host, that is the people of Israel. Again, I agree with uh, what the commentators Kyle and DeLitch say about this, why this is, should be understood as the people of Israel. And everything that was part of worshiping God, and this is given over. It says they gave these over to the awful little horn. That word gave over in verse 12, that the, those things are given over to the little horn is the same word that Daniel used in Daniel chapter 1 verse 2 when he said that God gave over the kingdom of Judah to Nebuchadnezzar. God did this. I don't think any preacher wants to say things like that. It's hard to hear. But it was because of transgression, because of the people's sin, that God did this. He did this as discipline for Israel's sins. That if we look back in the Old Testament, these sins were piling up ever since Israel first entered the Promised Land 858 years before this vision happened. And then Daniel's vision is interrupted. And we say, whew. But Daniel's vision is interrupted by the sound of someone speaking. Look with me at verse 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, that is, concerning the, concerning the regular worship, concerning the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? What's astounding here is that there's an answer that comes, but this angel, this holy one, asks the other holy one that was already speaking to explain. This angel defers to the authority and the wisdom, the knowledge of this first holy one. Who do angels defer to? Many scholars have argued that this is Christ, the first holy one speaking here. It was a, almost a totally unanimous uh, conclusion among all the early Protestants for a long time. Still, many will argue, this is Christ speaking here. And an angel asks Christ, and I agree, an angel asks Christ, how long? How long will this go on? Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5 teaches us, to, all the way to verse 7, teaches us to count it as an honor to suffer at the hands of God's enemies when it is for the sake of the kingdom of God. And it teaches us in that passage, 2 Thessalonians 1, 5-7, teaches us to hold on for the relief that is coming when Jesus returns. So these are dark times. But what a light the scripture gives. What kind of a light the scripture gives when things are so hard and things are so hopeless and people despair and in the morning you wish it was already evening and in the evening you can't wait for morning because of the dread in your hearts. And passages like 1 Thessalonians come along and tell us the suffering is not because God is angry with you all the time. Sometimes it is because of what God is doing in the world around you. But even then, in the midst of suffering, when you suffer, and you suffer for the kingdom of God, you are being honored. But even then, when you are being honored, and it's still so hard, and you want to know how long, there is hope coming on that day, there is relief coming on that day, when Jesus will return, and this evil will be over. To know that there is a reason for when the world goes so terribly wrong. To know with certainty that there is a day coming when a new dawn will bring righteousness and peace to the earth. Isn't that what we long for? And the whole weight of Bible prophecy attaches the hope of that day to the second coming of Jesus Christ because it's about Him. It's not some day we look forward to on the calendar. It's who's coming on that day. That's what we look forward to. He is the prince, the commander of the host. He is the divine speaker who answers the angel's question in the next verse. A glorious dawn is still to come. See, this prophecy 
is about the transgression of the Jews that caused the desolation that came upon them and the predicted restoration of Jerusalem. But it is also intended to apply to all of God's people, Jewish or not. It's supposed to apply to us. It's supposed to have some lesson for us. What God did in making Israel into a nation, what God did in teaching Israel his ways, giving them the law, warning them not to stray away, and then even after a long, long, long time of being patient, bringing judgment, the judgment that he warned about, well, all of that, all of what God did is like a sign to the rest of the whole world. He is the creator. We owe him our worship and obedience. And yet that's not what we give him. The death that as Paul said in Romans 5.14, the death that has ruled humanity's fate ever since Adam was also a sign, a warning to the human race to trust God before it's too late. To obey God before it's too late. To seek refuge in God before it is too late. See, there is, my friends, there is a specific reason for the specific desolations of the Jewish people. Daniel, verse 12, Daniel 8 verse 12 says it's because of transgression. 2 Kings 7 leaves us with no question about what transgression. And there is also a general reason for the general suffering of the human race. It's also transgression. It's also our sin. The sin of the whole human race, ever since the sin of our ancestor Adam. But what this prophecy does is shows us that there is a day coming when God will fix what we have broken. My brother was listening to one of my sermon recordings and he laughed because my voice cracked when I got excited. Well, you know, this is appropriate. There is a day coming when God will fix what we have broken. It's okay if your voice cracks a little because of the sheer amazing joy that what we are enduring now will not continue forever. As a sign of hope, this prophecy in Daniel chapter 8 that there is a day of restoration coming, this is a sign of hope. We need to really believe it. There is a day coming, according to Daniel's prophecy here, when even before the return of Jesus... As a token, as a sign, as a, a reminder to believe the promises, when God will restore Jerusalem and the Jewish people from all the desolations that he had brought on them. This passage tells us there is that day coming, to, that, that, that day when we see it happen, that we will stop and see what God has done and go, God is faithful. I will wait for that day when Jesus is coming. I have seen God do it once. I know he will do it again. Christ is the one who answers the angel's question. And he said, the restoration of holiness, literally, not the holy place, not sanctuary in verse 14, but the restoration of holiness will happen after 2300 evenings and mornings. Look at it, verse 14. He said to me, it's interesting, the angel asks, the person I believe is Christ here, the angel asks Christ, the speaker, and Christ answers and speaks to Daniel. That's interesting. And he also said to me, For 2300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. The holiness shall be restored to its rightful state. The word also said, can mean the, holy, the holiness shall be justified, made righteous. I'll show next week when we get talking about the angel's interpretation of this prophecy that this 2300 evenings and mornings is a very odd phrase in the whole scripture. But it's chosen here, I believe, because it hints at a wonderful truth that becomes clear later on in the New Testament. That even though Israel deserved God's full judgment, even though Israel's sins against God deserved a much greater desolation than God judged them with, that still, in spite of that, God will one day soften his heart and show mercy. That he will shorten the days of that wrath. Even though we also 
turn against God and rebel against him. And we also deserve his judgment that he shortens not only the consequences of sin in our life, but he gives us mercy that we could never, never deserve. And that too is a sign for the whole world. There is a day coming when God will fix what we have broken. 2300 evenings and mornings I began this sermon referencing the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 28 which in verse 66 I think it is says that while the Jewish people are scattered among the nations of the earth in the morning you shall say if only it were evening in the evening you shall say if only it were morning because of the dread that your heart shall feel and the sights that your eyes shall see the 2300 evenings and mornings and I'm nearly alone on this I haven't found another you know scholar who believes the same thing but I am convinced that when Daniel says the 2300 or when the, the he is answered by Christ that it's 2300 evenings and mornings that the oddness of that phrase points back to this passage in Deuteronomy 28 that Daniel is being told the desolation that is going to happen to Israel will be those 2300 evenings and mornings of dread and yet Daniel there is a savior speaking to you right now and yet Daniel there is a restoration coming so as we hear and I hope that the word of God has brought some conviction to our our own hearts that we say Lord how can I keep on sinning against you like I am but as we hear the Christ speaking to us in his word as we hear the promise that there is a day of restoration coming when holiness will be restored to us that's something we completely lack that our hope will be anchored in the Christ whose word is sure and certain and trustworthy the prophecy ends here saying the vision of the evenings and mornings is true. And I pray that you understand that because the Christ who speaks this prophecy to us is true. So Father, I ask that according to the reason why you gave us your word, as your son said, all the scripture is about him. I pray, Lord, that you would move in our hearts to turn from our sin Lord to seek obedience not to do so because of fear of punishment but to do so because of hope of joy and hope of being bound and united to Jesus Christ for eternity that we would see Jesus is better and more satisfying to our hearts than any sin ever could be why would we turn to what is false and empty and futile why would we put ourselves in slavery to masters that will only destroy us when we have a master who is gentle and humble and lowly of heart who said come and take my yoke upon you for my burden is light and my yoke is easy I will give you rest Lord teach us to come to Jesus Christ to hope in him to believe in him and to wait for him for we ask this in his name Amen